Hi, and welcome to the Love Coach Show. My name is Bruce Starr. I want to thank you so much for being here with me. Uh, I'm going to have a great show for you today. Uh, my guest is Marla Martinson, and Marla is a professional Beverly Hills matchmaker. And not just that, she's the author of two memoirs. One is called Diary of a Beverly Hills Matchmaker, and the second is called Hearts on the Line. She has appeared countless radio and TV shows, including The Today Show, WGN, uh, Chicago Morning News, San Diego Living, Beyond Belief with George Nuri, wow, on uh, Guyam TV, Urban Rush, and Better TV. And when not busy matchmaking or writing, she could be found sipping vanilla soy lattes, getting injected with Botox. Hey, we'll have to talk more about that. And try <laughs> and trying to get her husband to put the toilet seat down. Now, we're going to have to get into some very, very serious discussions about that. So I want to welcome my guest, <laughs> Marla Martinson. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, the Botox, I am in La La Land, all right? I live out here in L.A. I have to try to, at least. <laughs> and you being married, I'm sure you know about that damn toilet seat. It's like a war. Come on, put it down. Put the lid down. And my husband says, it's not the seat, it's the lid. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, if it's one thing I've learned is nobody has to ask me anymore to put the toilet seat down. I just do it. So I'm well trained. All right. All right. My husband's getting a lot better with that, too. It's after so many years, you know. <laughs> so I really want to find out about you. You know what, Marla? Tell me about you. Tell me even about who Marla was growing up, a, a young child, where you grew up, your education, kind of things that you did in the world that interest you. And then we're going to go to say, how did that end up with you becoming a matchmaker? But let's start with the very beginning. Okay. Well, <clears throat> Um, and, and I did put a lot of it in my memoir, Diary of a Beverly Hills Matchmaker. I talk about how I did that because, and the reason I wrote it is because people are so fascinated, especially years ago when matchmakers weren't that popular. Now it's like they're popping up everywhere. It's very mainstream since reality TV. But when I started, it was like, whoa, you know, I'm at a party and I'm, you're a matchmaker? Tell me. And everybody wanted to talk to me. Like, how did you get into it? What, how did, and they still, I'll get emails. How did you become a matchmaker? How can I do it? And it's, it's a job that I never imagined I'd have. I grew up in the suburbs of Seattle, Washington. Um, a little Gemini, you know, I, I think I came out of my mother's womb tap dancing, you know, whatever. <laughs> I was always, I mean, I from you know started with baton lessons to uh, dance lessons to wanting to be a writer to wanting to be the fastest tap dancer in the world. Then I asked my parents when I was in fourth grade to get me a ventriloquist. I wanted to be, you know, Sherry Lewis was famous at the time, you know, and with Lamb Chow, oh, I'm going to be a ventriloquist. So, and, and then an actress. And then it's like every year I had, a, and then I tried to learn the cello and that was a disaster. And I took singing lessons and I tried to do everything, right? So I just have so many interests. And even now my husband will say, Marla, do you want to go to the moon too? You know, you don't have time to do everything. And I said, but I have so many interests. So I came down to LA when I was 19 to be a movie star. And I did start doing television commercials, some print modeling. And uh, I was married at the time, had gotten married to my high school sweetheart and eloped. That's another whole story, crazy story. Uh, and I did that for at the actress slash waitress thing for 20 years. And I ended up waitressing more than acting and at 39 uh, after I had lived in Chicago also for, for a time and I had come back to LA because my father was terminally ill and he died and at 39 I was sitting there and I said and I my money was running out I was doing a little acting and I said to myself I cannot put on another waitress apron I can't I can't do it's not my dream nothing wrong with it I still have friends that are in the business wait waiting on the table it wasn't my dream I never felt in my soul happy about it and so I, but I said, I don't know what else to do. I'm only trained in, you know, acting and uh, the restaurant industry because I'd done everything. I'd even part owned a restaurant and everything. And so I said, God, I, and I'm very into the spiritual woo woo stuff. And I was saying my affirmations and every day I'd pray, I'd say, please. And I'd, I used to go to church on my way to work and pray and leave notes and say, God, please get me out of the restaurant business. I don't know what I can do. 
uh, but and I and I want to still act. I just don't know. Please help me. And then I met my now husband, and we were just dating. And he had a a friend who was taking over the management position at a video dating service called Great Expectations. And she said, "Hey, Marla, well, I'll hire you part time. You can be the videographer. Still go on your auditions." And I started doing that, and that was a lot of fun helping singles. Uh, and I felt like a director doing the video because back then, you know, you'd, we'd videotape them and they'd come in the office and look at it. And then uh, a year and a half after that, I moved on to a Beverly Hills matchmaking firm, thus Diary of a Beverly Hills Matchmaker. That's where the Beverly Hills came in. And I worked there for seven years. Never even, you know, when they asked me to work in the office, I said, I don't work in offices. I'm, a, I'm an actor, I, actor. I don't have office skills. They said, no, no, it's okay. And, you know, it proved that my people skills all the acting training, all the training that I've had was perfect fit for matchmaking because I've got to um, talk to people from all walks of life. I've got to work with all kinds of personalities. I stayed there and I was the head matchmaker, vice president of matchmaking, matching people all over the country. In 2009, that we were in the middle of a recession, nine months into the year there, September, and I had a, 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 me and the owner of that company didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. I ended up leaving a, a walkout, kind of take this job and shove it kind of a thing. And I walked in the door and my husband, I mean, it was like walk, you know, walking, what do you call it? Walking the dead man walking up to that door. <laughs> like, oh, he says, are you out of your mind quitting a job after seven years, a great job in Beverly Hills in the middle of a recession? There's no jobs. What are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know, but I had no choice. And I thought, I'm going to quit matchmaking. I can't, you know, I'm sick of it. It's stressful. I'm just burned out. And I was writing uh, the sequel, or I was writing Diary of Beverly Hills Matchmaker. And, uh, you know, I would have had to quit anyway when that came out. So I was going to get something going. So I started looking on Craigslist for jobs. I thought, gosh, that there's a little chapel, wedding chapel that needs somebody. There's... Uh, a youth hostel, I speak several languages. Nobody would, even for $10 an hour, nobody would hire me. And I was like, my money was running out. And then three months later, guys started calling me, the guys that I had been working with before. And they started saying, hey, I, are you doing anything? They'd look me up, they'd find me, Google me. Uh, I wanna work with you. And then I said, oh. and my husband said, start your own business, you know how to do it. And I, and I was afraid because I was in my late 40s, never owned a business, didn't, you know, I thought, God, if somebody complains, what, who can I, I can't send them to anybody, I'm going to have to deal with it. And uh, I did it. I took one client in January, another client in February, another one in March, another one, and they were just rolling in. And it's five years later, five and a half years later. And, uh, and I just went, I had a, I had a, I had a callback for a commercial the other day too. I still once in a while go on a, a, a audition, not that often. I'm writing another book. I have a, a YouTube channel called Conversations with Cupid where I interview experts. Um, oh, and then I became a crystal healer, Reiki practitioner, energy wow. worker. Um, so I'm just like going with my interests. And every day I get up, I'm excited. I, I can't wait to get up. Um, my days are packed, and I, but I just, I try to pack in as much as I can. What an, what That's me in a nutshell. What a great story. That's really, really wonderful, uh, Marla. But, you know, I, I do like to tell my story because for anybody out there who thinks that they're stuck in a job that they don't like or they have interests that they don't have time to pursue or that they're too afraid or, um, I, if gosh, if I could do it. I mean, here's a girl who, you know, high school education who flunked general math three times, you know. I, I, but, I, but I'm a bookworm. I read like five books at a time. I'm interested. I take workshops and classes. I educate myself. But it's like I didn't have major skills or anything that you, you, we society tells us that we have to have um, and so you use your heart felt your heart skills your your soul your passion and that's how you're gonna make a difference in your own life and other people's life and then I've been able to help so many people find the love of their life and go on to get married well I can see why you're so successful because you have a great presentation uh, you have a spiritual nature a spiritual center and that's the difference between uh, doing matchmaking with all the stress and people banging on you and doing it from love and doing it with kindness and from a spiritual center. I know that that's what's uh, setting you apart from the rest. And when people see this, 
they're going to go, wow, a spiritual matchmaker. I want to contact her. See, it is interesting because the people that are into that do contact me. They'll go to my website and say, oh, especially the women. They'll say, I was looking for matchmakers, and I really liked, I like that you do the crystal healing. I like that you have a spiritual base. I, you seem like somebody I want to work with. And, and I don't take women as paying clients, but I take them on free in my database, and, and they like to be with me, so that's great. I love that. So tell me how your company works now. You just started sort of mentioning it just now. Tell me, uh, you know, the, the, the structure of your company. The structure, um, I've kept it the same as when I was working in Beverly Hills because that's really the model that, that works out here. And I've noticed really nationwide, it's uh, a lot of matchmakers are, are doing this. It's the more affluent men uh, who are super busy. Uh, they have high standards and um, they're, you know, they want a beautiful woman inside and out. Uh, and so I take the, those as my paying clients. And then the women can join the database for free. Um, they are very particular. I mean, it is it is a stressful job because I've got this pile of you know guys that that are de demanding and they you know they they want the most beautiful woman and they want her now and, and slender, gorgeous, uh, smart, um, and that's you know a small percentage of the population. Let's face it. What in a, in the United States, how many people are overweight or obese now? 60, 70 percent, and these guys want super skinny. Um, so that right there, that part is a, is a you know, I'm searching for that. Um, and, it, and it gets comical sometimes. I mean, even in my, even in my book, I, I tell one guy, because no woman was even thin enough. I mean, I think I matched him with a size two, and he's like, yeah, but do you have anyone thinner? And I teased him. I said, yeah, I'm going to start trolling the morgues for a choice corpse for you to meet, because <laughs> I don't have anybody thinner. You know, so the, I do get the high-maintenance guys, but I love my guys. You know, they're, they're great. And uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. It keeps me on my toes. <laughs> That's great. So how can singles best use uh, a matchmaking service? H how would that work for them? Okay. You know, this is great because just before this interview, I had have a situation that I'm going to deal with later. And I, it gave me an idea that I'm going to make a video for my clients about because, okay, number one, matchmakers are not for everyone. If you, because I don't want people wasting their money, and some of the matchmaking services do take on women, and especially for the women, um, if you have some weight to, I mean, don't get mad at me, don't email me hate mail, but if you have some weight to, to get off of you, if you have some uh, relationship issues from your last relationship to deal with, if you're you know financially a ruin or, uh, don't waste your money now. Get yourself together because the guys that are coming to a matchmaker, paying a lot of money, expect a lot. I mean, they literally, they'll tell me, Marla, I don't want to meet, I can meet an average looking woman or an overweight woman at Starbucks. I don't need to pay you $10,000 or $20,000 to meet a lady like that. So everybody who's paying and going somewhere, they're like putting their major wish list and hoping for, you know, the women want George Clooney six feet tall, the men want Heidi Klum. And there are, you know, um, expectations to manage, and people do get a little out of reality. But, but I want to say that, you know, they'll, it's just not worth wasting your money. So get yourself together first. Are you somebody that you would want to meet? You want to be who you would want to meet. You can't ask to meet, you know, somebody, a, a Greek god, if you, you know, have some work to do on yourself. So be your best you. Let, like yourself. Be happy in your life. And then you know go do that. Otherwise, you can go online or do some other things. But and I and I'm always for that. Whether you're in a relationship or not, um, I'm always working on myself. I think it's very important. Um, so really think about that. And and matchmakers matchmaking services are a business. And some of the bigger ones they need to take on a large amount of people to pay all their bills. So keep that in mind. They might take you on when they really don't have anybody to match you with. So I'm just super honest. I have the luxury of working from home. I don't have a over a big overhead, and I can turn down people if I don't feel I can help them. You know, I'm not going to starve, so I don't have to just take on anybody. Um, second, a client uh, emailed me this morning, and he's kind of like, um, sometimes they'll just kind of be cracking the whip. You know, hey, you know, my contract says two a month, and I'm I had two last month, but we're you know not on track this month and don't you have recruiters down here and 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 you know I'm getting these emails all the time you've got to realize when you go to a matchmaker it's not like 
ordering a car or a sofa or you know have a wine of the month club where you're getting those two wines a month in the mailbox we have to search uh, usually your criteria is you know this list and if you can get up in the morning and just like if he would and I'm gonna tell him this if he could get up and like say okay you know God universe you know Buddha whatever energy field can you send a lot of white light to Marla today so that she can be best assisted by the universe to help me find my soulmate and just start with a really positive attitude instead of hey you know I didn't that girl wasn't pretty enough don't you know my criteria I don't like blondes I want I want exotic or it makes me like, oh, can't, I can't wait till this guy's contract's over. <laughs> and let me just, what am I going to do? And it puts me in, in a frenetic uh, field. Um, I want to, you know, have a great relationship and, and really love my clients. And so if, if you as a client can, can do that and just breathe and take a little time and realize it's a process, we are looking, we're, it's, it's sometimes hard to find, um, and just give us a little space and, and time to do our job. Um, and it, it sounds like it's it's not the kind of business where they should hand over their power to you. They can hand over a little bit to you, but it's not about handing over all their power. And I think that's where, yeah, you know, they can learn a nice balance. Yeah, if they can say, cause it's like, why are you hiring me? You don't trust me. You don't want it to, you know, even I had a client yesterday who finally met somebody. He was like turning her down from the picture and I said you don't understand I know her she takes terrible pictures she is a, a, you know it doesn't get any better than this gal what's it gonna what are you gonna lose by going on one date you know you can say no to he goes well do I have to say yes to everybody you say I said no but can't you trust me on some and so he's gonna do that tonight um, but yeah it's like they'll hire a matchmaker but then they won't go out with who you yet tell them to <laughs> like then go stay go on match.com and pick your own matches I just I, it's give your matchmaker some trust if it's if this is their profession and and you've decided to work together what dealing with people with control issues is that what I'm hearing <laughs> yeah you know give, yeah, it is hard for men I think sometimes to give that control away because they're used to running especially my guys they're the high-powered guys they've got you know so yes that's a that's a good point Bruce <laughs> we could talk about this on another show but you know what I believe that there's uh, an incredible balance that somebody like you and somebody like me can create in people so that they're not just looking to give their power away, but they're looking to take the best from you and then work on themselves. As you've already said, and the more they work on themselves, the less they're going to give their power away to someone to just, you know, just come through for them and get them pretty and get them sexy. That, that can't possibly be, you know of the highest nature for themselves yes and I still get and I, I'm always surprised because people say oh give us some dating tips and I'm like dating tips really adults still need dating tips you need to hear these things I, I feel like I'm boring people with them so I don't want to talk about it but I keep getting the feedback that these grown-ups I mean they could be 30 40 50 years of age and they're still talking about their ex on the first date I hear all Marla all this woman did was talk about her ex I felt like I was in a therapy session and I thought that this was something everybody knew already and I tell it and I say it and I'm gonna have to make more videos on it because here could be a great match there was chemistry they like each other but the other person was so turned off they're like well she's not ready because all she did was talk about her ex or she's not interested in me or what am I I'm buying a hundred dollar dinner here to sit and listen to this woman talk about the guy that she wishes she could get back and it's such a turn off so tell me about some other first date tips. <laughs> <laughs> That's my big one right there. Okay, everybody, no ex date talk. And if you feel like you're gonna have to do it, don't go. Get over it, or get the guy back or the woman back first. Don't go on any dates and waste anybody's time, including your own. Um, or, or hire a therapist, or call me. I'll listen to your, you know, woes. Okay, <laughs> don't do it to the people. Uh, first date tips. Also, of course, you know the the the, the cell phones. Texting on the date, um, answering calls, looking down. Okay, okay, put the cell phones away. Unless you're a doctor or a parent that might, you know, have to get a call, put the cell phone away. Um, well, be on time. Uh, you know, just the courteous things, guys. A great tip for guys. Women love it if the guy pays the val 
valet ticket. Uh, not many men do it. A lot of women are struggling financially. Even if you know a valet could you know be <clears throat> be a struggle for them, especially when we had this recession. I mean, and and a simple what it could it be five to ten bucks, and it shows that you're a gentleman and that you you stand out from the crowd. <clears throat> Making sure she gets to the car. Okay, I've had girls say that. You know, there wasn't any chemistry, so it was dark and at night, and he's just like, okay, see ya, good luck, you know, bye. And he takes off in his car, and she's standing there in the, in the dark. Um, so just be, I would say, go on a first date as if you're meeting a new person, a possible friend. Don't put all of that, um, your eggs in one basket, all of that angst. Is this the, you know, father of my future children? Uh, is this the one? Is this my soulmate? Oh, my God. Just go on it as, hey, you know what? What are you about? What am I about? Let's have a great time and then see if any, anything develops. That's, that's the, I think, the best way. It takes the pressure off. That's great. Wonderful, wonderful advice. Uh, <laughs> so now, when should someone decide, hmm, I think I need a matchmaker? And part two of that question is, once they decide they need one, I'm sure – and there's a, a 101 different kinds of matchmakers. How do they figure out for themselves? How do they decide on the best matchmaker for them? Well, you you know you you can be ready for a matchmaker if maybe you're new to town, um, you're divorced, you haven't met anybody in a long time. Maybe you're super busy and you don't want to go out to a bar or sit online. You want somebody to do that work for you. Um, you have the money to spend on it because it can be expensive, thousands of dollars, and you want to, and there's no guarantee um, that we will find you the right person. And a lot of times it's not us, it's, it's you. You know, we can't predict chemistry, uh, or if you're too picky, you have too long of a list or whatever, uh, we do our best, but we cannot unfortunately guarantee that you're going to get the relationship. So you've got to have that disposable income that you're willing to risk to lose in case it doesn't work out. Uh, and then pick, you know, meet with the matchmakers. There, there are big matchmaking companies that take on a lot of people. They're more like dating services. There's small boutique matchmakers like myself. Uh, I work with the high-end guys. So, are you going to fit in to what they're looking for? You know, ask. Do you take on mostly women as paying clients? Men as paying clients? Uh, the ones that take on a lot of women paying clients often they don't have enough uh, men. You know, for the women. So you want to ask and. Ask some other people who have used the service. Um, oh, and I will say, you know, this uh, industry does attract a lot. It's, there's a lot of emotion to it, all right? And a lot of people will get upset if they don't meet someone. Um, there's a small amount of people who have, you know, emotional issues, bipolar, uh, mental issues, and we find that out later. Uh, we usually have a small percentage of that, and, and it's hard to deal with, and they'll get angry, and I'll get texts late at night like, you know, where's my match? And uh, one guy texted me, oh, if I was a matchmaker, I, if, I, I, if I were you, I'd be ashamed to call myself a matchmaker. And then threatening uh, lawsuits, uh, putting bad reviews online. Um, so I think probably every matchmaker has at least one negative review. So don't always go by the negative reviews uh, because people are, are emotional. Maybe it was them that the reason they didn't get into a relationship and they'll go and rant, and you know how the internet is now. So, so I would say go with your heart and your gut about that certain matchmaker that you meet with, and uh, you can maybe talk to some people that they've worked with. But, uh, yeah, do your homework and go with your gut. That's great. I, I, I learned a lot about your business. Uh, so let's do this. Show either your book or books once more, and where, where can people find your book? Amazon.com. I've got a Diary of a Beverly Hills Matchmaker. Hearts on the Line is the sequel. And then I have a short story called Amateur Night, which is super fun, about a fateful Valentine's night when I was waiting on tables. <laughs> and you can get that on Amazon. Or if you go to my website, MarlaMartinson.com, uh, M-A-R-L-A, M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N. And you can sign up for my newsletter and get Amateur Night for free. Um, and my uh, interview series on uh, called... Conversations with Cupid on YouTube is always fun. And I've just got a lot. If you go to my website, everything's there. There's a lot of fun stuff. And I love hearing from people. If you have any questions, you know, ask it in the comments, after, you know, under this interview or email me, and I'll be glad to, to uh, talk to you. 
Well, I'm really glad that I uh, that you came on the show and we got to know each other. And the folks out there will see this uh, video for a long time to come. And uh, I think you'd be the, the perfect lady to work with if uh, people are coming from a spiritual center as well as those, you know, uh, uh, top uh, executives that you already have working with you. So I wish you all the best of luck, continued success, and uh I look forward to connecting with you here once again. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Bruce. Bye. Bye, everybody.